What I want to talk to you about is the fact that most approaches to information security, uh, they tend to focus on a product or a standard or an organization. And the goal then is to secure a relatively small group of people against a relatively narrow set of very, fairly well understood threats while relegating any existential or political or economic or other extreme threats to the category of insurance policies or forlorn hope. And this is kind of okay, but the largest threat models uh, are constructed on a, on a national scale. They uh, are created in the form of defense policies for military situations and increasingly, uh, and thankfully, for medical and economic and humanitarian or natural disasters. So the, free, uh, the things that uh, happen in these largest uh, threat models is that they frequently factor in many non-threats for political purposes. Uh, as is common when referring to terrorist threats or cyber war, uh, neither of which has anywhere near the annual effect um, as other more severe threats in society, such as ischemic heart disease or stroke or car accidents or you know, uh, curable poverty-driven diseases. So what I'm going to try and do over the next uh, couple of minutes is, is explore humanity-scale approach to information security. And I'm going to argue that uh, such approaches are needed in order to protect humanity as a whole against vast threats, uh, whether they're political or corporate or systemic. Uh, and although information security is, is really only one form of security, and I'm not going to talk about the others, it's, information security is increasingly a basis for other kinds of security as critical infrastructure and other aspects of modern life are uh, globally increasingly heavily dependent on information systems. So I'm going to break this down into chapters. The first one is this. So the current user base of the internet is roughly 2.5 billion people. And by virtually every estimate, this number is going to double in the next five years. Uh, as various parts of the world, including uh, India and China and Sub-Saharan Africa, come online in greater measure. And as this happens, new economic opportunities are arising globally, both in the form of uh, possibilities for electronic commerce and in the form of services uh, provided to those who are coming online. And these, of course, uh, each have kind of secondary and tertiary knock-on effects, uh, which further compound and permeate through the local and global economies, right? But those people who join the internet, they're faced with this more gas board of, of service options, uh, catering to a wide range of all sorts of different activities and desires. Uh, and whether it's email services or social networking, photo sharing services, uh, social recommendation systems, electronic banking, uh, news services, instant messaging, teleconferencing, collaborative document editing, whatever, you know, the, there are service providers out there that are willing to provide it. But these providers are predominantly large, they're predominantly American, and within a very narrow margin of error, have no economic, political, or social ties to the vast majority of the countries where they provide the service. So most of these don't really care that through the, the provision of their services, they're providing a near global surveillance coverage of, uh, to the governments of their countries at virtually zero marginal cost, or actually virtually zero cost at all, as a side effect of, of in, uh, being in the business of service provision. So none of these has taken affirmative action, none, to provide strong cryptographically guaranteed privacy to the people that are coming online. Nor will they, because their customers are not asking for privacy. Their customers are asking for impressions and click-throughs and conversions. And there are people, well, the people who are coming online and the people who are already there, they're merely eyeballs for the advertising industry to market at, uh, as far as these predominantly American, predominantly large corporations are concerned. So because of this, there's a risk that the next billion people that come online unwittingly subject themselves to empire, not maybe in the traditional sense of 
uh, colonial superpowers invading foreign lands and extracting material resources to fuel you know, vapid consumer cultures in the Western uh, bourgeois, you know, but more in the metamodernist sense of, of being subject to service-determined vendor lock-in on a societal level. So this is relevant to us, to information security people, in the same way as cloud computing is relevant to information security people. Uh, because, in fact, it's actually the same question. I just framed it a little bit differently. Because when we talk about uh, security in the cloud, we, we talk about identity management and physical and personal security. Uh, we, t uh, we talk about availability and application security. We talk about privacy. We talk about logging and controls, right? Uh, we talk about legal compliance, contractual compliance. We talk about business continuity and data recovery. And we go on and on about these things, but we never once admit to ourselves that what we're really talking about is sovereignty and self-determination. So at the end of the day, every individual who has no agency to make enlightened decisions about which services they're going to use and the environment in which they're going to operate um, and the political implications of those choices uh, is at risk of increasing centralization of humanity at the cost of everybody's security. So this is why I refer to humanity scale secur uh, information security as an economic problem. Uh, and the economics of information security at the uh, hundreds of millions of persons level, uh, or, is, uh, or the billions of persons level, is very, very different from the economics of, uh, at the hundreds of persons or, or even millions of persons level. Now, give you a concrete, practical example of this. Uh, SSL key unraveling attack. It's, it's a pretty standard birthday attack. We know that there's an infinity of prime numbers, but we also know that there's merely a relatively large, finite number of prime numbers within any given integer range. So if you pass me a 1,024-bit uh, RSA key, uh, a public key, uh, I need to test a very large number of primes in order to find the factors, right? But if, it turns out that if you pass me, say, a million or several million RSA public keys, uh, the likelihood of any two keys sharing at least one factor, oops, uh, grows quite, uh, pretty quickly. So then I just need to start off with a couple of dozen uh, public keys and start testing them. And each time I find a, a, a new shared key, then I just add it to my list of knowns and, and continue. And this is a, an embarrassingly parallelizable activity. So. Um, it's, it's an interesting piece of evidence that critical mass can weaken systems that are secure at a smaller scale, right? But we have to ask, who is all of this information security for when we're developing it? So let's postulate some kind of really, really extremely powerful adversary. Oh, we don't have to. Um, you know, we don't have to invent one because the governments of the Anglosphere have studiously provide us, uh, provided us with five eyes with which to do it, right? Um, and so let's run some numbers. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the United States has an annual budget of $52 billion, roughly. Uh, that covers the CIA, the NSA, some other things, but it doesn't uh, include the U.S. Cyber Command. It doesn't uh, include uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence or any U.S. Air Force surveillance activities or research done at the National Defense University or other similar organizations, right? Uh, and uh, if we use that as a basis for extrapolation uh, over the rest of the US surveillance industrial complex and the British and the Canadian and the Australian and New Zealand analogs, you know, we come to a pretty reasonable assumption that there's uh, an upper bound to their budget being roughly $120 billion per year, okay? And now, um, you know, as I said before, there's roughly 2.5 billion uh, people who use the internet and about um, 2.5 billion people who are therefore affected by NSAs and the, the Five Eyes surveillance effort. And to break that number down a bit, so conser current conservative estimates put the number of users of email globally at about 1.9 to 2.5 uh, billion users, right? 
Um, and Facebook has 1.15 billion users, Skype has 600 million users, Twitter is similar size, uh, Dropbox is 175 million users, there's a billion Android smartphones and tablets in circulation, 250 million uh, iPhones, iPads, right? Um, and amongst email users, there's 435 million people who use Gmail. That's uh, self-reporting from Google from a couple of years ago, so it's probably gone up. Uh, 325 million use Outlook.com, which used to be called Hotmail. Um, 298 million use Yahoo Mail. The top 10 providers are, in the aggregate, it hosts between 70 and 90 percent. It's hard to estimate uh, of all of the legitimate, that is to say, non-spam email, uh, with the top 50 providers probably accounting for close to 99 percent, right? 50 providers, 99 percent. Uh, and further, during a single day last year, NSA Special Source Operations Branch, they collected 444,743 email addresses, uh, address books from Yahoo, 105,068 from Hotmail, 82,857 from Facebook, 33,697 from Gmail, and 22,881 from other uh, unspecified providers, right? So this gives us some idea of, of the relative internal security capacitors of, uh, capacities of these core vendors. And it's long been known that Yahoo's security uh, is quite bad when it comes to user privacy. But, okay, let's use these numbers now. So $120 billion over 2.5 billion people over 365 days a year gives us a cost estimation of this catch-all surveillance at about 13 cents per person per day. So let's call that figure PPV. I'm going to come back to it later. Price per day of violation. So this is incredibly cost-effective for uh, surveillance states. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of that 120 billion are going to various tasks which are not directly related to spying on the general public. So everything from uh, clean keeping floors clean in Fort Meade to, you know, conducting drone strikes on people in Pakistan. Um, but since we don't know the exact division and we, we don't know all of the factors that come into this uh, system of systemic human rights violations, uh, let's just use the total figure. Be, and actually that's better for the analysis that follows because it assumes that their capacity is greater than it actually is which is to say that uh, the bias assumption that uh, pervasive ubiquitous surveillance is bad leads us to want to overestimate rather than underestimate, okay? So lots of assumptions here. And of course, if it was possible, uh, I'd prefer to be accurate, you know? But the asymmetric nature of clandestine surveillance um, makes that really hard. So given this insanely low figure, Admittedly, it's one that uh, should be subjected to uh, a lot of you know, large amounts of scrutiny and you know, so on, right? We're forced to ask ourselves who, if anybody, the concept of information security that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis is intended to protect. In order to make an assessment of that, let's review the ecosystem a bit. So a rudimentary scan of available software shows us some very shocking things. Uh, protected transport layer, for instance. We have SSL, which is generally quite good as long as you don't run into any of its numerous failure modes. And there are a lot of them. And they're all subtle. And none of them are easily communicated to end users. Um, it's the most commonly secure, uh, de deployed security infrastructure, uh, probably. Uh, and, and yet, only a narrow margin of users actually know what it is and what to do when they're faced with warnings generated by SSL. And on top of that, statistics from 2012 showed that around 90% uh, of the top million websites were vulnerable to the beast attack. So since 2012, I'm guessing that that number hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, and you know, many SSL certificates and setups are still vulnerable uh, to, to the beast attack out of the box today, which is pretty bad. But let's move on. So hard disk encryption, 
This is something everybody should be doing. And it's becoming more and more commonplace. But in particular, uh, MacOS uh, gets uh, you know, good props for including file, uh, file Vault, uh, which is off by default. So Windows doesn't bundle BitLocker unless you use their enterprise edition. And some Linux flavors come with the encryption out of the box. But what this means is that nobody is going to encrypt their hard drives unless they're security aware geeks like us or they're forced to by corporate policy. Okay. Um, so how about the application layer? Well, we have browsers, of course, which are relatively robust as long as you don't install any plugins that get full privileges to the computer. Because the common user does not understand uh, the full implications of allowing a plugin to access all data on your websites, or access your bookmarks, or access all of your tabs, or your history, or inject arbitrary JavaScript wherever it wants. So I could continue down this path ad nauseum. You know, it isn't very far to nauseum. But the conclusion we must come to is that information security has been until now been for advanced computer scientists in a corporate environment and pretty much for nobody else. And anybody else who has been even marginally secure has been, uh, can be discounted as statistical noise or a happy accident. Right? That's not a very good situation. So what then is to be done? You know, it's clear that there's roughly 2.5 billion people on the internet today. There's about five, in about five years, there's about two billion more. The hardware is commonly compromised. The software is generally insecure. The protocols, the standards we rely on are, uh, have failure modes that most people can't even fathom. And well, despite all this, I, I think there is, are some relatively simple attacks that can be taken, uh, uh, taken uh, no, uh, steps, sorry, not attacks. <laughs> um, simple steps that can be taken to price an attacker off the market in a generic case. So specifically, I'd like to suggest a program by which we, the information security community, uh, can reduce the general case attack viability to about 32,000 pe targeted people per day. You can run the math on this later. That's still a pretty large number. 32,000 people is a lot of people. but it, means that those who wish to target those people must put effort into it, and that those 32,000 people should know that they had you know, better up their game, really. Uh, this is similar to Chris Rock's um, observation that if bullets cost $5,000, there would be no innocent bystanders. Right? If somebody gets shot, you really know that they must have pissed somebody off. So. Let's make the bullet cost $10,000. I want us to raise the average price of privacy violation to $10,000 per person per day. Does that sound like an exciting security challenge? So this isn't a replacement for anything that you're doing with regard to application security or network security or, uh, you know, this doesn't say, mean that you can stop um, preventing malware or closing ODAs or, or anything like that. This is a pure addition. Sorry, more workload, more work. But it's an addition which works to the benefit of everybody, uh, while also hopefully making the more focused efforts a bit, more, a bit easier, right? Because if everybody's more secure, then that means slightly fewer ODAs need to, uh, that we need to worry about. So it's three-pronged. Three things, decentralize, encrypt, and harden. None of this is surprising, right? Everything on this list is something you're already doing, I hope. Every large centralized service must be replaced with a peer-to-peer -peer alternative. Every bit of information that's stored or transmitted must be strongly encrypted. Every computational endpoint must be hardened against malicious attacks, uh, preferably in a way that's language theoretically verifiable, right? If we can verify the grammars, then we're good. Now, that's ordered from uh, easiest to hardest. Hardening is hard. Redecentralizing the internet is relatively easy in comparison. So it would seem, uh, you know, at first glance, that any ambitious plan 
like that would necessitate a great amount of revision and innovation of new protocols and you know, adding new stuff to the internet. And the complexity would lie quite heavily in, in exchanging broken systems for new ones. The 2.5 billion email users of the world uh, are not going to give up their email overnight. And you know, just to use some newfangled thing. In fact, actually, you know, Facebook and, and various others, Twitter and so on, have, have discovered that uh, even producing a newfangled thing is not necessarily going to move people off existing infrastructure. All of the systems, the online services we use are email-based as, as an underlying identity mechanism. So let's think about this for a moment. You probably don't realize that today, this year, email is 49 years old. So since 1965, a lot has changed. We've stopped using bang paths as an explicit addressing mechanism. We've, uh, we've got a lot more devices that are online on average. Uh, we have you know, fewer that clock in to do batch fetches. Um, the devices that we use to interact with email have improved quite a lot. Uh, but for some reason, email itself has hardly changed at all. Uh, as far as I can tell, there have only been three major innovations in email since 1965. Um, the first was 1973, with the adoption of standardized email headers. Okay, you're late. <laughs> so, um, Standardized email headers, they, they lead to uh, a massive increase in system interoperability, right? Um, the second was the late 80s uh, or early 90s, depending on how you count it. Um, it was when the original paradigm of email, uh, it uh, had a list of emails provided, and one can view them one by one, right? The early inventors of email, they they hardly envisioned that there would be a future where more people, uh, where, where people got more than 20 or 30 email messages per day. <clears throat> so how were they to know that their technology would, you know, more so than mobile phones even? <clears throat> That's good. Uh, more so than mobile phones, the email is a backbone of the global economy. Virtually nothing happens in an international context anymore without there being an email trail of some sort. You know, think, of, <clears throat> think of how you do uh, contracts and how you negotiate contracts and how you keep in touch with, with people you meet at conferences and so on. You know, this is the backbone of the global economy. And so IMAP kind of epitomizes the, the second great innovation of email, the transition to multiple inboxes, to folders, filters, and upstream synchronization, right? So the third was unleashed in 2006. It's Gmail. It had been a long time coming, and Gmail, for all its ills, moved us uh, away from the list of lists, mutually exclusive, folder paradigm to a search and tag based paradigm. There are many other things that made Gmail interesting and Gmail is a really, really fantastic tool as long as you don't get served with a subpoena. Uh, in secret, it takes a year or two to find out about that. That was kind of annoying. But almost everything else that email did beyond the move to search uh, as, as core paradigm was just an incremental improvement on Hotmail, if you think about it. Sure, a gigabyte worth of storage, you know, where Hotmail still had 15. That's still just an incremental improvement, right? So, I don't know. You know, I, I find it really shocking that over the course of nearly half a century, such a fundamentally important technology has had so little in the way of innovation. <clears throat> and there's reasons for this of course. Chiefly amongst them is that email was not a technology that anybody owned. Uh, the availability to market services on email was always considered marginal. Uh, and those who tried were always bound to be, uh, you know, have to find ways to be interoperable with everybody else. So the result of that was uh, this weird competition in the 90s, you might remember it, between RTF and HTML to provide rich text formatting on email. 
uh, which HTML won, only not really, you know. And then competition between JavaScript and VB, uh, Virtual Basic Script uh, to provide interactivity in email, which, you know, it turns out was more a liability than a benefit. And, you know, thankfully, somebody killed that idea relatively early on. Do you remember that patch uh, for Windows, which, um, you know, was issued as a security patch? And when you installed it, uh, it basically flipped the toggle on whether VB was allowed in, in email. That was kind of funny. <clears throat> so, you know, there's been some improvement on spam filtering, which is a necessary evil. Uh, we were all too happy to outsource spam filtering up to upstream servers, entirely ignoring the fact that spam filtering is actually a form of censorship, even though it's a convenient one, right? And, you know, companies and people sense this inertia. They were watching the downfall of Usenet. They were hungry for new methods to communicate in the light of new technologies such as Ajax. And so my generation de decided to start building social networks. Um, they argued that by providing centralized alternatives to the chaos, you know, providing alternatives to email, with more frills, more spying, better user experience, more advertising, uh, then everything would get better. So we had MySpace, and we had Facebook, and we had Twitter, and now Google+. And each of these replacements uh, re represents a model in, of how the designers believed that social interaction should be done in the 21st century. So the social model of Facebook is that of the five-year-old. Hi, do you want to be my friend? And Twitter, by contrast, follows the friendship paradigm of a 13-year-old. Wow, you're cool. I'm going to follow you. And Google Plus has not really gained much traction, perhaps because its understanding of friendship emulates that of a sociopath. The neurotic belief that explicit management of friendships is something that normal people want to spend their time doing. But Despite all this, it's email with its 2.4 billion users that is the most popular social network uh, with its adult model of friendship and where you conduct, you know, contact who you will, when you will, and all else is implicit. But nobody treats it as a social network. Everybody treats it as email. Nobody owns it, nobody operates it, nobody innovates on it, and nobody has prepared it for the future. So email is just one example of many. Uh, I think it's relevant in that it's the most used communication technology. Um, it's the most powerful. It's also the most disregarded. But it serves as a template. We don't have to reinvent the internet in order to secure everybody. We, just, we don't have to make any new protocols. You know, we can just start by fixing what we've got. So. Oddly, this is mostly a user experience problem. Um, there are some problems with the mathematics of security, but they're relatively few and relatively obscure. It's much more the economics of security that need to be fixed, and we do so by provi making, you know, providing security as an easy-to-use thing. We security people, we're terrible at this. We're absolutely you know, god-awful. Because we love our little tinkering toys and our mathematics and our encryption methods and our cipher suites and whatever, but we don't really care that much about people. And you know that's really sad because, well, I mean, for one thing, if if we security guys actually cared about people, there might be a slightly better gender balance in the room. Uh, but there's also the other thing that, at the end of the day, information security is supposed to be about people. Technology is supposed to be about people. And while we sit around with our cipher suites and our, our mathematics, that's not going to improve. You know, it, if every peer-to-peer -peer connection between email servers was SSL encrypted, we'd be getting somewhere. If everybody uh, was to come up with, uh, well, if somebody even, was to come up with a simple way to provide end-to-end -end encryption on all email, we'd get a lot further. Don't say PGP. And if we can get 100 million people to use PGP by some method, yeah, right. You know, even if they're unaware that they're using PGP, then we're starting to make progress, right? If we were to take 
100 million of those 435 million who are locked into Gmail and give them an easy way to use PGP, then we're starting to win. So over the last year, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to get a, gra a grasp on this, try to understand the extent of this problem. <clears throat> and uh, I, I want to expand on this, uh, hopefully with your help. And the, the major categories of software that need to be fixed include email and instant messaging and collaborative document editing and file storage and more. Uh, but for now, I'm focusing on two aspects of the plan. First, education. It's really important that people understand that there is a problem and it can be fixed. But it's also important that people feel empowered to use the solutions when they become available. You know, there's a real risk that cloud computing will come upon a rainy day you know, clouds rain, did you notice that? And when the cloud rains, is it our private data that rains upon everybody? You know, but it's our duty to assure, ensure that when that day comes, everybody has a roof over their head, okay? And the most important single project I'm involved in right now is MailPile. It's, uh, it's a slightly less than humble attempt to take back email. Um, Mail, MailPal is a, a web-based email client. It's free software. You can get it on GitHub. You can run it on your laptop or your VPS or your Raspberry Pi. You can store it in the cloud or on your person. It's written in Python. Uh, last time I counted, it was about 14,000 lines of code, which is pretty, pretty dense. You know, it, it includes, you know, in those 14,000 lines, a pretty fast search engine, a Bayesian spam filter, powerful tagging engine, contact management, you know, lots of really cool things. It's not ready yet, though. Um, we launched the alpha version two weeks ago, roughly. Um, and version 1.0 is due at the end of summer unless we screw up, right? Um, so when it's ready, we hope that it'll serve as a new standard for what email can be. Uh, while conforming with all of the old standards, it, you know, every file it will store it'll store encrypted. Uh, every email it'll send, it'll aggressively attempt to encrypt in some way. Um, it'll also be aggressive in the proliferation of public keys. And uh, so as, you know, the people that you're communicating with uh, have, should have no excuse not to encrypt to you. And I think MailPal is pretty exciting. Uh, I'm not gonna do a full demo here, but you can talk to me afterwards if you're interested. But uh, it's only one piece of the puzzle. And getting 100 million people to use Gmail will cause some lightning in the cloud cover. But it won't raise the cost of privacy uh, violation to $10,000 per person per day. You know, that'll require a lot more effort. So I propose MailPile as the first $100, OK? I'd really appreciate your help in getting the rest of the way to 10,000. Thanks.